Uh, welcome everybody to the UN 2030 Sustainable Development Colloquium. My name is Ken Brealy, I'm the Associate Dean in the College of Arts. First thing I want to do is welcome you all and let me acknowledge here and now that we are presenting this colloquium on the traditional unceded territory of the Stalo people. We do thank them for this privilege and by the way, arguably for showing us a model of what this event is really about. We say in our mission statement that we are a regional teaching intensive university committed to the best undergraduate education in Canada, to be a leader of the social, cultural, economic and environmentally responsible development of the Fraser Valley, and to be entrepreneurial and innovative while we do so. We say that doing these things will allow us to change lives and build communities. To paraphrase Latour, is it not our mission statement really saying, bring us your quasi-objects and we will deconstruct them? And if this means learning to think, and again, like alchemists, astrologers, phrenologists and shamans, then so be it. We are honoured to welcome Yvonne as moderator for this event for a very exciting, fun and multidisciplinary event tonight. We'd like to thank him and this is an opportunity to showcase the role that UFE plays in our commitment to educating our students, our colleagues, our friends and our family members about the importance of the Sustainable Development Goals and to demonstrate the scale and ambition of this new Universal Agenda. Over the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to go to the 17 goals we're not going to do them justice, obviously, two or three minutes per goal. Uh, and I will invite some colleagues and students to make some short comments. And uh, this, uh, of course, is not an in-depth study. It's just a first contact with those goals. Uh, it is an opportunity for all of us to see uh, how these goals uh, fit uh, in our own respective spheres of activity and how we can perhaps contribute to achieving them over the next 15 years. In Canada, based on recent Statistics Canada, uh, Statistics Canada, the 2011 data, still one to 10 people are still under the, the, the taken as a poor. Okay. So next week, we have a new election. I mean, we see the, what's coming up. But all these are policy focusing on those low-income people, such as child tax credit or even minimum wage law. Uh, recently, I mean, in PC, we have a 20 cents go up just three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Okay, all those ones that are also part of this program as well. So, as uh, the policy analysis or student, we kind of keep it interest in how those policy will affect in people who stay in the poor under the uh, below the poverty line, even in Canada, not only all the other developing countries. So, how will it impact on us? as a Canadian as well. So this is not for a certain country, certain region only, it also includes us as well. That's one uh, feedback I want to add up. Globally, more than 800 million people still live in extreme poverty. The new goals are more ambitious than the last ones. Ending poverty in all its forms everywhere means more than increasing minimum incomes. It means guaranteeing access to decent work, education, healthcare and other services and ending inequality, discrimination, and exclusion from decision-making. And this is a universal goal. It applies here in Canada as well. By 2030, there should be no child poverty in a country this wealthy. There should be no food banks. We could do better, both abroad and at home. Two and a half years ago at UFV, we introduced a BA in Global Development Studies focused on development goals like these. Since then, we have graduated five students already and have over 20 students declared in the degree. Clearly, we have committed and ambitious students. Now it is time for the politicians and administrators to get on board. So to achieve this goal, goal number two, we need to create sustainable agricultural livelihoods that don't degrade the natural resources. We need to develop equitable and efficient distribution systems. It's unrealistic to expect that technology is going to provide a second green revolution like the 1960s. But by changing attitudes and applying new technology, we can make agriculture more productive and more sustainable. To get there, we need biologists, computer programmers, water technicians, resource managers, engineers, educators, community organizers, program managers, and of course entrepreneurs. They need to be people who believe in sustainable agriculture. I want to say to you that this evening that this goal, the goal of good health, cannot be viewed in isolation. It's really interconnected uh, to all the other goals, in fact, that health is impacted by poverty, 
by nutrition and sustainable agriculture, by education, by gender inequality and sanitation and sources of energy and infrastructure and access to justice and other things, pollution and climate change. That these things, what many scholars determine uh, that are the, the social determinants of health, and I quote the World Health Organization in defining these as the conditions in which people are born, they grow and work and live um, and age, are the wider set of forces and systems shaping um, the conditions of daily life. So to conclude for maximal impact, I want to say to you that mobilizing action for change requires an approach that integrates health indicators as a component of the drivers of sustainable development. Um, we've had an opportunity to do um, work with the UN Habitat uh, with a project called MNS Academy where we allow students, um, youth to do sustainable development courses and they're able to learn for free online. Um, it's been a wonderful experience, not only for me because I get real life job experience um, and I'm able to teach people use the skills and knowledge that I've learned uh, throughout my degree and then share that with everybody else in their community and um, impact their community for change. Um, not everybody has been as fortunate as I have um, to be here and have a quality education and so it's really important that everybody else also gets an opportunity to. Um, it was like the old adage that knowledge is power. I feel that we as individuals and an institution have the opportunity to use that power to enact positive change through education to eradicate poverty. I met a young girl, her name was Solemna, she was 14 years old, lived in a small community called Gowada. Run for Water, we are a charity that raises money for clean water. We just installed a large-scale water system for about 18,000 people, which is about three collective villages in that area. And I asked Salamnish, I said, oh, you know, tell me what clean water means to you, that we brought clean water to, to your village. And she said, and she just rattled, she, she knew a little bit of English, she, she just kind of looked at me, she began to rattle these things off, and I'll never forget the conversation. This is what she said. She said, what clean water means to me is that I get to go to school for the very first time in my life because I've been walking as a slave for water for five hours a day ever since I can remember. I, I can now get to go to school for the first time because I have water two feet away from me. Now, I don't have to fear being raped at night because when I would go to school, I would have to do my water walk after school when it was dark and I've been raped many times. I'm bawling as she's telling me this story and I'm like, what? This is what it means? She goes, you know what else it means? I get to have dreams for the first time because I'm now no longer stuck in this trap of just getting water, maybe getting married at the age of 14, and then, you know, that's my life. She goes, now I can go to school. I can have dreams. I can move forward in my life. I can, have, I can feel free because I have water. Scholars have lamented on the fact that if researchers ignored situations in Africa with respect to its poor ICT and its slow pace of integration with a global information economy, this would only mean the gap between Africa and the rest of the world will widen. Kenya's budget, less than 5% is spent on healthcare. Canada last year spent $215 billion on healthcare. That's about 11% of Canadian GDP. We need to encourage countries like Kenya to begin to focus on the role of women and children and empower them to make a difference. Countries such as Brazil, India, China that scored high on the MDGs had rapid economic growth and were able to reinvest in public health, infrastructure, and education. And this is what UFV and the Khan University are doing in Kenya. I wanted to talk about reducing the inequality among social groups within countries, and of course I want to have a focus in on Indigenous peoples within this country and how we might reduce some of the inequalities amongst uh, Indigenous and the rest of Canada. So when I looked at some of the things outlined in our handout, one of them being the elimination of discriminatory laws, policies and practices, I went immediately to the elimination of the Indian Act. I think that is certainly one of the most um, biggest, largest steps that we could take and I can certainly see it happening within the next 15 years. The Indian Act is by far one of the, uh, one of the most oppressive pieces of legislation Canada has ever put 
into force and effect and it still is in place in 2015 so I think by 2030 we can certainly aim to have it abolished and replaced with something geared towards Indigenous resurgence and empowerment. We could also have a look at the numbers of Indigenous peoples currently filling the prison system and work at eliminating or at least minimizing the overrepresentation of Indigenous peoples within the system. We have an overrepresentation of Indigenous children within the care of the Ministry of Children and Family Services and I think there's a lot of good work that be, can easily be done uh, over the next 15 years in reducing those numbers in, in terms of policy, practice and discriminatory laws. Food sovereignty is a huge thing for Canadians, in particular Indigenous peoples. For us to have access to our own food sources, we're not able to gain our calcium from dairy the way most Canadians can. We need to get our calcium from our fish. We need unfettered um, access to our food supply and food sovereignty. So what I would like to see is for, for within the next 15 years for me able to me to be able to change the stories that I'm telling and to be able to move towards stories of empowerment and stories of victory because there are way more of those to be told in relation to Indigenous peoples um, than the victimization and the sad stories. So if you go to the Global Goals um, Facebook page or their internet site, on that page they highlight the importance of sustainable communities as it relates to children specifically. So in that context, while I teach here, I also do work as a professional planner. And I'd like to quickly share with you one project I worked on this summer. I had the opportunity to consult with 500 children in Somalia, Southern Sudan and Northern Uganda. And Mark, I didn't take any students with me. Um, having said that, what I learned from them was not only what you would expect in terms of the importance of reducing conflict and the need for peace, but really what was most substantive to me was that they all desired sustainable, inclusive, safe places to play, to learn, to be educated in, and to dream. I'm very pleased and privileged to work towards goal number 11 and look forward to future students working on this with me. At UFV here, I teach and research climate change and um, teaching, I like to teach climate variability because that helps put climate change in perspective. For instance, uh, climate changes that are occurring now are small compared to changes that have occurred in the past. And, uh, but the difference that we notice now is that the changes are much faster than they've been in the past. So there's quite a difference between the changes now and the changes in the past. And research-wise, I am um, interested in uh, recent climate change and uh, how much um, of these changes are affected by atmospheric processes and the uh, effect that these processes have on either speeding up or slowing down the changes. For instance, uh, are the climate change moving trending upward, downward, or are these moving in a cyclical pattern? These are questions that we need to address. The actions of man, including climate change, as uh, uh, the previous speaker just talked, is affecting water uh, life forms. Um, one of the critical things that you may have heard is the disappearance of, of corals because of the bleaching that is happening, the, the acidification of the waters. Right? There is also overfishing. We are depleting a lot of our fish species. Um, there are pathogens that we don't know about. There is viruses that are affecting starfish. So there are many things that are changing, including our, um, just, uh, our agricultural activities, which are sending into the, uh, the water, the runoff from agriculture, pesticides that even though may have been targeted for insects, there are gazillion invertebrates in, in water that are being affected, as are the, the larger animals. So my goal, and that of all of the biologists that I know of, is to protect water, protect the life forms that we have, and that's a great goal that to, to work for. So there are two major things standing in the way of sustainability that absolutely must change and one is the conversation which always ends up into a fight between the environment and the economy and social issues are left out of the conversation or largely ignored yet the three of them are supposed to get equal consideration and that is not ha happening hence the rise in homelessness unaffordable housing health crisis and many others that we've heard of already tonight. The second is that all levels of government 
um, I'm afraid to say, have all but abdicated their role in monitoring and enforcement of environmental regulation. They've slashed the staff and budgets to such a degree that they mainly rely on voluntary compliance and the public monitoring and reporting. So you can have the best laws in the world, but if you aren't monitoring and enforcing them, they're completely useless. Now they said it was to remove red tape, but the result is that they've created an unlevel playing field and they've only actually assisted the unethical operations to get away with polluting more and they've made it, made it way more difficult for the ones who truly want to operate responsibility to compete economically. So of course we can blame the politicians for that and we should take some of the blame absolutely, but the public has to take um, a little bit of responsibility as well because we are continually demanding lower taxes but we have to take responsibility and realize that we have to be willing to pay the increase in taxes for better oversight to protect our quality of life and very survival. Now I should say that my teaching um, of international relations and you know by virtue of finding myself in political science it touches on almost all the themes that has been you know um, uh, um, have been discussed, but my research specifically is focused on this very goal of promoting justice and institutions. Um, there is no one continent on this planet that has been, you know, um, engulfed in violent conflict than the African, you know, continent. And currently, my research is um, looking at, you know, analyzing Canada's multilateral um, role through NATO to intervene in conflict um, uh, and to assist the African Union to undertake uh, complex humanitarian um, and um, security operations, including you know, response to terrorism, which is a major um, you know, threat on the African continent. So just to conclude, I will say that this is a very important goal. The fact remains that all these goals about poverty um, can be achieved. We can create sustainable cities. We can, you know, have sustainable, you know, water, clean energy. But one single conflict can undo all of them. So it is such an important goal. So yeah, some of the relevant targets to goal 16 specifically include significantly reducing all forms of violence, ending abuse, exploitation, trafficking, and all forms of violence and torture against children, promoting the rule of law at the national and international levels to ensure equal access to justice for all, and ensuring responsive, inclusive, participatory, and representative decision-making at all levels. So how is this relevant to our discipline and to the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice? I would argue that it is directly relevant through the courses that my colleagues and I teach in the school, through the multidisciplinary connections to other departments and programs that we have, like we have done tonight for this fantastic event, and for the ongoing research projects that my colleagues and I are involved in in the school. I think through this we are working towards achieving this goal by making these global connections, putting the public first, engaging in collaborative and coordinated research and preventing and educating in an effort to build a better future for all, including those who have been denied, denied the opportunity to do so. As a future criminologist, I am particularly interested in Sustainable Development Goal 16. However, I believe that Sustainable Development Goal 17 may be the most significant goal. It is said that what gets measured gets done, and agreeing on a global indicator framework to monitor progress towards these sustainable development goals is essential. I believe that this is where many of us can make contributions toward the sustainable development goals. We are here in university gathering the expertise and knowledge that can contribute towards making this world a better place. Together we can bridge the expertise and knowledge of today to the capacity of tomorrow. My own work in this area, I, this has been what I've done this year, uh, among other things, basically helping develop uh, a set of indicators to measure the achievement of those goals, particularly goal 16, including the goal of prevention of conflict in post-conflict societies. So I've had the pleasure of uh, developing this and as uh, Trevor alluded to, at the end of this month there will be the second meeting of the interagency expert group to try to finalize a set of indicators to measure progress and of course when you're talking about measurement you're talking about a branch of science a practical application of science in an area where most of us all of us can play a role in terms of assisting 
uh, the process of building a capacity to measure, as Trevor was mentioning, but also getting involved ourselves in measuring and critically reviewing these measures and indicators that are, uh, that are produced by countries and, and various institutions. So my name is Sierra Nickel. I am currently an undergraduate student here studying geography and urban planning. And my name is Jeremy Wagner. I graduated in December of 2014 uh, with a major in political science. And my name is Josh Rempel and I'm in geography specializing in environmental science. And there was another member of our team, Marie Verbankov. She is a criminology major and Unfortunately, she couldn't be here tonight. We uh, just got back from a four-month intern or a three-month internship in Eastern Africa. Uh, we were stationed in Dar es Salaam, and we were doing a food security project looking at um, supermarket procurement systems um, within Dar es Salaam and kind of where they were getting their food from and the food systems um, that they used to procure their food from. So, in in linking uh, this uh, research to the uh, uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, UFE has the capacity to act globally, and this entire event tonight has paid tribute to that, I think. Um, and now, uh, this internship opportunity is just one of the ways in which UFE is doing this. By building partnerships, as Sherry was mentioning, with universities in East Africa and participating in student exchanges, we not only offer students both locally and abroad world-class educational opportunities, but we also empower undergraduate students by placing them within a public context where they too can participate in achieving these sustainable development goals. Now, in tying our research to the SDGs, it's difficult to narrow our research down to a single goal or even a couple. As it has been said tonight already, the problem is multidisciplinary, most generally, and it requires collaborative effort, efforts from so many corners of the public sphere. It surely falls under goal number two, zero hunger, as well as goal number 12, responsible consumption and production. But the issue is multifaceted and includes so many different stakeholders. So goal 17 is vital to the success of building sustainable food systems within the region. The internship plays an active role in goal 17 through the creation of international partnerships between universities, promoting knowledge sharing and sustain around su sustainable food systems and uh, by facilitating these undergraduate research opportunities. My name is Michaela and I am a fourth year geography student here at UFE and I am hoping to go into the PDP this summer. I want to become a teacher. And I'm Lisa Harrington. Hi. Um, I'm a social work student here at UFB and I'll be graduating in January. But... I further my knowledge of education in developing countries while focusing on primary education in Tanzania. I visited various private and public schools and spoke to many knowledgeable people about the concerns and struggles that the education system is facing. Although there are many debates on how to implement these changes, the majority of people agree that improving education is crucial for the further development of Tanzania. I feel that in my time in Tanzania, working at Kids Care Tanzania under the guidance of Mary Notman and Sherry Ends, we worked on multiple goals, but the one I'd like to talk about tonight is gender equality. Um, so something that they do that's not really outlined so clearly when you first see the organization is that they are constantly empowering young girls to become strong, self-sufficient young women. I met so many wonderful children that weren't going to stop doing things based on their gender. When a game of football starts, no girl's told she can't play and it isn't a question whether she's welcome there. And I think this is actually really well illustrated in the attitudes and values of the young boys that are at Kids Care. When I made my own clumsy attempt to learn football, their favorite sport, they continually encouraged me and invited me into the game and wanted me to become strong as they were. They wanted me to be a part of it and it was never a question whether I was welcome or not.